I tell you what, when we get to the end of our lives, most of us will be able to find three, four, five perhaps key moments, turning points in our lives, which ended up defining us. This is my wife, Meryn. She is smart, she is funny, she is pretty, she's mine. <laughs> Our big turning point came on Christmas Eve of 2010. By that stage, we had been spending 10 years, a whole decade, trying to start a family. And you name it, we tried it. We tried IVF numerous rounds. We waited for two years on the New South Wales Adoption Register, waiting for the phone call to come, saying, your little boy, your little girl is ready. Come on in, come and get them. The phone call never came. We tried special diets. We tried healing prayer numerous times. We tried, friends, chiropractic. And to this day, I don't know why. <laughs> and you know what? We got to a point by December of 2010, 10 years of journeying with that whole experience of you know, working our way through the wilderness, and we, we tried our hardest, we had done everything, we tried to be faithful through all that as well, and we got to December of 2010, and we decided, right, this last round of IVF is it. We had one embryo left to transfer. And that embryo was transferred, by this stage our faith was actually in all sorts of messes, my wife Merrin was really, really struggling by this stage. <clears throat> and when that embryo was transferred, uh, we said, this is it, if this doesn't work, then we are going to either not go back to IVF, not go back to adoption, we're going to move on as a childless couple, and if we do that, then, we'll swap mics, eh? Okay. We're going to move on as a childless couple, and then we got the news that we never expected we would get. We had Emily from the IVF clinic ring us up on uh, that particular day, and she said, it's looking good. And my wife said, define the word good. <laughs> are we talking good or are we talking good? And Emily said, all your hormone levels are exactly where we'd expect them to be for a pregnancy. Well, can you imagine the jubilation that erupted amongst our family and friends? And I discovered that day, friends, that if you ever want to make your mother squeal, tell her she's going to be a grandmother. It's actually a really good party trick. Go home and try it tonight. And so our mothers were squealing and our friends were elated and everything. It was amazing. After 10 years, God has finally answered your prayer. You're going to have a child. On Christmas Eve of 2010, Emily calls back and she says to Merrin, I'm so sorry. Things have changed. And with that, Merrin put the phone down. She went into our room, curled up in a fetal position. And that's where our 10-year dream of having a child ended. Sometimes life is kind of difficult, right? Now, the only thing that Merrin had wanted to be, apart from become a mum, is she had wanted to live and work overseas. And so when she was offered a job at Oxford University... OK, let's stop right there. That's the bit where you are supposed to go, ooh. <laughs> Friends, it's Oxford University. It's one of the greatest universities in the world, OK? It's not Edith Cowan, I know that. <laughs> but you get what you're given. Let's try it again. So when Merrin was offered a job at Edith Cowan University, when <laughs> Merrin was offered a job at Oxford University, everybody says that. I never knew why. We saw that as God's consolation prize for her. So we packed up our bags. We uh, rented out our house. We started flying over to the UK. We got to Oxford. Friends, C.S. Lewis wrote the Narnia Chronicles in a little house just up the road and around the corner from me. Friends, J.R.R. Tolkien wrote The Lord of the Rings in another house just at the other end of that. You don't need to be jealous or anything. <laughs> we arrived at this amazing place. Merrin had her first day at the university, and she came back with a smile. A job was no replacement for a child, but it was a new beginning that she needed. Coming to Oxford for Merrin was like leaving the wilderness and entering the promised land. And coming to Oxford for me, it was like leaving the wilderness and entering a brand new wilderness. <laughs> because there had been a cost to that move. Things had been going very well for me here. I'd had a dream of starting a particular kind of radio show, and we started that in 2006. It was called Open House. It started to reach a lot of people with Christian things. When I got to the UK, BBC weren't returning my phone calls. When I uh, was here, I was having great opportunities to speak and uh, got to speak to senators and members of uh, parliament at 
Australian Parliament House. When I got to the UK, nobody's calling my number. When I was here, I was publishing books, and ha, people were buying them. When I got to the UK, publishers were turning me down. They said, who's Sheridan Boise? Nobody's going to buy a book from him. And friends, I would love to say that I walked through those couple of years and said, yes, I am victorious. Yes, I am amazing, and I'm, a, I'm an overcomer in Christ. No, of course, I fell into jealousy. I fell into envy and all the things that everybody else had that I never had. I felt those things things. A little voice whispered to me, Sheridan, you used to be listened to by thousands. Nobody cares what you have to say. You're spiritually washed up. You're spiritually impotent. You, nobody cares what you... Whose voice was that, by the way? Friends, sometimes we wake to a day, a world of bright skies, crystal skies, and wonderful possibilities. And other times we wake to a world where the rain is battering our windows and the thunder is rattling our homes. How can we remain resilient? How can we be strong through the storms of life? In 2011, I tried a little experiment. I decided I would read the Sermon on the Mount every day for a month. I started reading this amazing speech, only three chapters, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And friends, can I suggest to you that Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount, is the ultimate guide to life. Not just that. It's the ultimate guide to the resilient life. And it starts with an invitation. Jesus climbs up the hills, the rolling hills, luscious green hills, uh, just by Lake Galilee there, and he gets up and he says some very famous words. Let's all say them together because these are important. Let's say them together. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are the persecuted. Friends, these are profound words. In Jesus' day, you were considered blessed for pretty much the same reasons you'd be considered blessed today. If you looked good, if you had a model family, if you had a lot of friends on Facebook, you were considered blessed if you were healthy, if you were wealthy, if you were influential. You weren't considered blessed if you were poor in spirit. You weren't considered blessed if you were the meek. You weren't considered blessed for those kinds of reasons. Those were not the kind of people who got the invitations to the parties. All the people who got the invitations to the parties were the rich and the powerful and the people who had it all together. And yet, Jesus says, blessed are you. Blessed are you. He blesses the most unexpected people. I've lived in four major cities so far, and I'm sorry, Perth, but I have to give the award to Sydney for the most memorable public transport experiences. Aww. I'm sorry. Here's why. I was on the 436 bus heading into Sydney City one morning. It was a Monday morning, 10 o'clock. Funnily enough, there was only two of us on the bus. There was me on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side was a, a girl in a Victoria coffee T-shirt. I'm assuming she was going to work at a cafe. We head off down Parramatta Road. We pull into a bus stop. A, a woman in maybe her kind of mid-50s with a faded floral dress gets onto the bus, pays her fare, starts walking up the aisle and ignoring the 100 empty seats in the rest of the bus, comes and sits right down next to me. <laughs> and I looked over at Coffee Lady. You know what she did? She looked at me and she went, We started pulling off and we kept on going down Parramatta Road, the kind of three of us in silence. And after a while, Floral Lady did the most extraordinary thing. She looked at me. She thrust her head into my face. In fact, she came so close, the hairs on her chin almost tickled me. And with her brown eyes bared and bulging and her, her stained teeth bared, she yelled at me, I'm all right, aren't I? Now, how would you respond? in a situation like that. You know when you just don't have the right words? So I did what any theologically trained, wholeheartedly devoted follower of Jesus would do in that situation. I lied. <laughs> and I said, well, of course you're all right. And she says, well, some th people think I'm funny in the head. And I said, now why would they think that? 
She said she didn't know, and she fell into silence. I tried to engage her in further conversation, but she was gone, her thoughts away in the clouds. We kept on driving a few more moments in silence. After a few more moments, she gets up from the chair. She starts crossing the aisle and ignoring the 100 empty seats and the rest of the bus. She goes and sits down next to coffee lady. I wave and I smile. <laughs> and she did it to her. I'm all right, aren't I? And friends, I wondered how many times the rest of the day that question would be asked. And I wondered how deep was the anxiety in that woman's soul that she longed for security so desperately she would seek it from any old stranger on the bus. Am I all right? Am I okay? Am I valuable? Am I lovable? She's not the only one asking those questions, right? We all ask those questions, and my goodness, we ask those questions when we go through the storms. We ask those questions when the rain is falling, the flood waters are rising, when the, when the wind is beating against our house. We ask those I was. I was. Am I, am I valuable? When nobody's ringing me? When I'm not useful anymore? What, what am my life about? Who am I, Sheridan? When we have those moments, remember the Sermon on the Mount, friends. Who does Jesus consider the blessed ones? It's the little people. It's the little people. It's the little people who have their crooked teeth and their empty purses. It's the little people who walk around on buses and in the rest of Sydney asking if they are okay. Isn't it wonderful, friends, that in a world that considers the blessed people the ones who look great on Instagram, and my goodness, I'm jealous of you hipsters who can do your hipster beards because I try to grow a hipster beard. It just doesn't work. I get little tufts, right? So, you know, some of us just can't add up there. Isn't it great that in a world where you're valuable and your lovability is kind of judged by how many likes you get on a Facebook page or a Facebook post, isn't it great that in the midst of all of that, in a world that considers how wonderful you are and how valuable you are to be down to whether you've studied at a great university like Oxford University or something like that, whether you've come from this side of the tracks or that side of the tracks, isn't it great, friends, that in the midst of that, Jesus ignores the world's popularity lists? Amen. Amen. He looks to the little people, and this is the thing. With Jesus on the scene, the insignificant ones are the ones who are the blessed ones, and their blessing is their strength. Their blessing is their resilience. So the Sermon on the Mount begins with this invitation, and it continues with a calling. Now, just imagine for a moment that Australia is in a political mess. Can you imagine that? <laughs> not hard, she says, not hard. Just imagine that Australia is in a political mess and you are elected Prime Minister to sort it out. And you have a wonderful plan that you know is going to bring prosperity back to the country. You have a plan that will make Australia great again. No, I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't go there. What do you do? You can call anybody to your side to come and serve with you. What do you do? Well, you go and scour the land for the finest people you can find, right? You scour the land for the greatest thinkers and economists and strategists that there are, there are out there, and you gather them all to your side and say, let's go and do this. Because this is no time for little people. This is time for big, influential, front cover of the magazine's talent. This is a time for those kinds of people, not the little people, not the insignificant people. That's what I'd do. It's not what Jesus would do. The same people that he's just blessed. The poor in spirit. Those who are meek, the persecuted, all those people that you would least expect to be the blessed ones. He then says these words. Let's again read them together. He says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? You, my little friends, you are the ones who are to bring out the God flavors of the world. You are the ones who are to point out the goodness and truth and beauty that is there in all the good things in your office, in your school, at university, at church, everywhere where you work, in your workplace. You are the ones who are to bring out the God flavors of the kingdom. And then he says this, you, you are the light of the world. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father. You are the one who brings out the God colors of the world, as Eugene Peterson beautifully put. You are the one who shines with the light of Jesus and leads people out of darkness. Salt of the earth, light of the world, 
And you think about who the people Jesus was talking to and you have to say, are you sure? Have you got this right, Jesus? Because these are little people, these are fishermen, these are farmers, these are humble homemakers. These, there's no power in the room here. There's no influence filling the room in this particular situation. See, when Jesus is around, he turns the little people into the people who change the world. You have never heard of James and Anne. They've never been on TV. They've never written a book about their story. There's a Christian couple in communist China. As you probably know, until recently, in communist China, if you have a second child, they've got a one, they had until recently a one-child policy. If you have a second child, you face very steep stigmatization. You also face very steep financial penalties as a result of that. So when James and Anne discovered that they were pregnant for the second time, they heard the message from their government very loud and clear in their eyes from the very day that they heard that news. And that message was, you need to abort. That message became louder when they discovered a few weeks later that the child that Anne was carrying actually had some significant heart defects. Now, in a country like China, we don't have quite the same degree of infrastructure that we do when it comes to looking after children with special needs like that. And so there was a, a message there directly from the voice of the doctor, directly from his, his mouth, you need to abort. That message got even louder and even stronger, and that pressure got stronger when they went and told their family. In China, there's a certain stigma associated with children with disabilities. James and Anne would never be able to look, at a look after a child with that kind of needs by themselves, wouldn't just be able to finance it. And the family said, you need to abort. So right from the day one, the pressure on James and Anne from their government, from their doctor, from their family, from their culture. Can you imagine, just imagine, that kind of pressure? Can you imagine that? James and Anne looked at each one of those people, each one of those voices, and they said, we are Christians. No matter what defects our child has, she's made in the image of God. We will not abort. There came a time when it was uh, Anne's day to deliver her child, and would you believe that even as she was being wheeled into the delivery area, the nurses were offering her an abortion right to the very end. And yet little Chen Yu was born, and James and Anne enjoyed seven weeks with her until she died. It's a sad story, but it's got a twist. The doctor was so impacted by what he saw in James and Anne communist, atheist, doctor, so impacted, he said, if every parent in China treated their children the way you've treated little Chen Yu, we would have a different country. And then he invited J James and Anne to come in and be interviewed by all his students so they could see what a different kind of parenting looked like. And did you see the ripples that were starting to happen there as they started to impact and show a different kind of way of living and a different approach to these kinds of things? You see what happened there? Little people, little people being salt and light and starting to change the society through what they did. Little people, little people. Because when Jesus is around, it's not just the insignificant who become blessed, it's the small who become great. You with me, Riverview? So there's an invitation, there's a calling, and then there's a challenge when Jesus starts speaking in the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> there's no comforter of the hills here, there's a disturber of our souls, my goodness. When we go into this next session of the Sermon on the Mount, he starts to get really tough. And if you were to do something like I did and read the Sermon on the Mount every day for a month, you would start to get really challenged because in this section, he then starts talking about hate being as bad as murder and a swear word leading us to hell and lust being as bad as adultery and basically the grounds for divorce being virtually nil. He'd say, look, you keep your commitments, make your yes be yes and your no be no. Don't be these kind of wishy-washy people who say neither. He would say, don't do your praying in public and make sure your fasting is kept private and don't do all your spirituality so you can be applauded for it. He starts really hammering things out and the most bone-shaking things he says is not everyone who calls on me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Ooh. 
No hallmark card platitudes from this Jesus. But can I suggest to you that the golden thread throughout all that Jesus says, the golden thread that all he says is this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength and love your neighbour as yourself. And you biblical exegetes who are sitting in the audience are saying, that's not in the Sermon on the Mount, Sheridan. That's actually Matthew 22. Well done you. But can I suggest it's still the golden thread and it makes its way up in this really key verse in the Sermon on the Mount. Let's read it all together. Because again, he says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Oh, my goodness. Love your enemies. That's where the, that's the pinnacle of loving God and loving others comes. Because when Jesus is around, this is what is to break out in the most difficult of circumstances. I've had the opportunity of interviewing some fascinating people over the years, 2,000-odd people over the years. And one of those people is somebody who's actually been on this very stage. In fact, some of you may well remember him, Johnny Lee Clary. Anybody remember Johnny Lee Clary speaking? Probably in the early 2000s. Johnny Lee Clary was the former imperial wizard, worldwide leader of the Ku Klux Klan. He was the guy who was responsible for white supremacy being kind of spread throughout the world and this idea that black people are somehow cursed of God. And one day he had an opportunity to debate a uh, black reverend named Reverend Wade Watts. And he had this debate in a radio station in Oklahoma. And as they met, you can imagine it would have been pretty tense off air before they go on air. You imagine them kind of being in the green room together, hey? And apparently what Wade Watts did is he put out his hand to Johnny Lee Clary and he said, Hello, Johnny Lee. I just want you to know that I love you and Jesus loves you. How's that? How disarming is that? They went into the radio studio, and they had this debate, and Johnny was saying all the reasons why blacks and whites should be kept separated, and Reverend Watts was refuting every claim from Scripture, and afterwards, Johnny Lee Clary wanted to get out of that studio as fast as he could, and before he could, Reverend Watts called out to him, and he said, nothing you can do can make me hate you, Johnny Lee. I'm going to love you and pray for you whether you like it or not. Well, that stirred Johnny up, and so from that moment on, up went the ante. They burnt down one of Wade Watts' churches and set fire to another one of his churches. They smashed his windows. They burnt effigies on his lawn. His children, many of whom were adopted, had to be escorted to school by the authorities because they were under threat. They ramped it up. And yet in every way, Wade Watts refused to retaliate. He continued to love his enemy, and sometimes in very, very clever ways. One day, Johnny Lee called him up and said, Reverend Watts, we're coming to get you, and this time we mean business. And you know what Reverend Watts said? Hello, Johnny Lee. Lovely to hear from you. You don't have to come to me. I can come to you. There's a lovely little restaurant on the highway, Highway 170 there. I'm buying. <laughs> as good as that? They got there. There's Ray, Reverend Watts having a meal. They burst in. They surround the table. All the men in the KKK around them, kind of surrounding. And Johnny Lee <laughs> leans in and says to Wade Watts, what you're about to do to that piece of chicken is exactly what we're about to do to you. You know what Wade Watts does? He picks up the piece of chicken and he kisses it. <laughs> I want to be that quick. I want to be that quick. Time after time after time, love against evil, love against evil. Johnny Lee Clary's life started to disintegrate, fell apart, he ended up leaving the clan, he ended up becoming a Christian. One day he rings up Reverend Watts to tell him the news. You know what Reverend Watts says? Have you preached anywhere yet, son? Why don't you give me the honour of preaching your very first time in my all-black church? <laughs> and so Reverend Watts invited the former imperial wizard of the Ku Klux Klan to come and preach his very first sermon in the very church this guy had once set fire to. That is powerful. Friends, a resilient life is not built on lust. It's not built on greed. It's not built on retaliation. A resilient life is built on forgiveness and reconciliation and love, love, love. 
that's what brings a resilient life. Sermon on the Mount begins with an invitation. It continues with a calling. It, oh, my goodness, it gives us a challenge. A challenge to overcome evil with love. To transform evil with love. And then it finishes up with a promise. It finishes up with a promise. If you've been in church for a while, maybe in Sunday school, you sang a little song about a builder who built, two builders who, who built their houses, one on sand and one on rock. And this is the story that comes from the end of the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus is wrapping it all up. And he tells a story. Well, there was two builders, and there was one guy who did the proper preparation work. He kind of got rid of all the sand. He found the bedrock. He started building his house on the bedrock from there up. The other guy couldn't be bothered. He just started building his house on the sand. The storms came. The winds beat against both houses. One stood, the other one collapsed. And Jesus kind of brings that together. And he says, listen, here is the meaning. And let's read it again together. Therefore, Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Little ones, he says, little ones who I called to be my world changers, here is the way you're going to be resilient through life storms. Don't just listen to my words. Put them in to practice. Put them in to practice. Now, Jesus is no slick telemarketer. He's no slick salesman offering kind of seven-step formulas for success with a twinkle in his eye and a smile in his mouth. He's not doing that as he stands in the kind of Galilean mountains there giving his Sermon on the Mount. He's at the peak of his popularity. But very quickly, things are going to change. Very quickly, his very own people in Galilee are going to kind of drive him out. Very quickly, his own family are going to think that he's mad and say, look, we need to take him to the hospital. Very quickly, his finance manager isn't going to embezzle his funds. Very quickly, there's going to be a political scheme hatched to take his life. Very quickly, there's going to be people, his very own friends, who are going to betray him. Very quickly, you're going to find that this political scheme is successful. And Jesus, the one everybody is saying, how amazing are his words, is going to be pinned to two pieces of wood, have, have nails as thick as my thumb put through both wrists and both feet. Very soon it's going to look like this is not a resilient man, but very soon, three days later, right, he's going to raise again to defeat sin and death and evil forever. He's going to raise, he's going to be resurrected. And this is the ultimate kind of resilience that the world can never give us. Psychologists can give us wonderful tools. In fact, they're discovering some of the things that are in the Sermon on the Mount now. But this is the kind of resilience that can never be given apart from Jesus, apart from him. Because this is a kind of resilience that is built on resurrection. The God that we follow specializing in taking weakness and brokenness and turning it into strength and new beginnings. In 2014, Hayden Nelson and I s sat on this, on this uh, riser here, and we started talking about Merrin's and my journey, one of the first times that we had, actually. We started talking about how we had gone through this wilderness, and we weren't too sure what God was doing in it. We weren't too sure how was God, God was going to redeem it. We, we believed he was going to redeem it in some kind of way. It's the best we could do. All we could do was keep on following Jesus through the storm because we didn't quite know how it was going to end. On the Sunday night of that day in 2014, last service at Riverview, a guy called, comes up, walks up here, and he says to me, I haven't been to church in 26 years. All this week I had this sense that I had to come to church. I did a Google search and this was the first church that came up. And what you've said tonight about broken dreams has been exactly what I needed to hear. Lost my marriage, my business has just failed. I feel like I'm supposed to be here. I love that. Immediately after him, as he stepped aside, we prayed for him, gave him a Bible, got him connected in with the pastors. A couple walked up. The guy said, I haven't been to church for years. And the girl said, I've never been to church. But all this week we had this strange sense that we were supposed to get to church. And we did a Google search and this was the first church that came up. And everything you've said about broken dreams and hopefully new beginnings is exactly what we needed to hear. 
It's almost like we're meant to be here. <laughs> a few months ago, I was speaking at a church in York, in England. And after I'd shared a message about our whole story, a guy comes up to me. I never go to church. I've never been to this church. I was walking past. Something drew me in. And everything you've shared tonight about broken dreams and maybe new beginnings is exactly what I needed to hear. Because tonight I'd planned to take my life. But now I'm not going to anymore. Because now I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. Do you see what happened there? Jesus took the weak things of the world and turned them into strength. Turned them into a new opportunity for there to be unexpected strength. Turned them into a new opportunity for there to be resilience. Band are going to come up and we're just going to, I guess, land this. And I'm going to ask you, uh, if you would mind standing with me as we kind of just see where all of this is going. The band aren't coming up? No, nope. oh, they are. Oh, my goodness, they're amazing, they're invisible. They're kind of like a Holy Spirit, just always there present. <laughs> and friends, maybe you're going through a storm right now. Remember where Jesus has been going with the Sermon on the Mount. He's been saying the insignificant are the blessed ones. He's been saying that the small are the ones who become great. He's been saying that evil becomes love when he's around, and he's been, he's been saying that weakness becomes strength when he's around. Those are the ways that we become resilient. And friends, maybe, no, my goodness, I'm almost expecting one of you to come up and say, I haven't been to church in years. <laughs> I did a Google search, and what's been said tonight is that what I needed to hear. If that's you, my goodness, we can't wait to pray for you. We cannot wait because God's doing something in your life. He's drawing you to himself. He wants you to be his child and have a new, resilient, strong life. But maybe right now you're going through a storm. Maybe you're mopping up after the last storm. And maybe you kind of need this resilience. I'm gonna just kind of shout out some phrases. And if you want to, if you want to confidently and prayerfully reflect those back by shouting them after me, then we can make this declaration as to what Jesus wants to do in our lives. Okay, are you ready? I am a child of God. I am a follower of Jesus. He says, I am the salt of the earth. I am the light of the world. I will get through the storm by following him. I am a child of God. I'm a follower of Jesus. I am the salt of the earth. I'm the light of the world. I will get through the storm by following him. Riverview Church, when you look back in history and you look back on the history of your church, Look at the timeline. Just like our individual lives, there will be a certain number of turning points in it, a certain number of points which defined who you became, a certain number of points, and they were crisis moments. They were storms. And friends, if you've been here for a while, you know that <laughs> Riverview has already been through a couple of those, and each time you have become stronger and stronger and stronger. And Riverview Church... Blessing this city. I tell you what, the things that we've experienced here in Perth, we haven't seen elsewhere, and part of that is because of what God's done in Riverview, in and through for the rest of Perth and beyond. But friends, <laughs> you're facing another storm, and this weekend is symbolic of that with saying goodbye to Hayden Nelson. So unexpected, right? So unexpected, a, a broken dream for some people, right? And yet, we follow a God who brings new beginnings after the broken dreams. We follow a God who takes to the weak things of the world, the weak moments, and turns them into strength. I'm going to give a few more sentences, hey? And if you feel like standing with me and declaring boldly and passionately and prayerfully, you might like to say these things as well. Because all the factors that lead to a resilient individual life will lead to a resilient church life, right? Because it's going to be the little people. You and me and the person sitting next to you. Nobody big and mighty is going to come in, apart from God. Nobody big and mighty, no big kind of corporate person is going to come in and fix this. It's Jesus working through the little people because that's the people that he used, right? And it's going to be the people who wake up and actually say, okay, well, there's going to be disappointment and there's going to be discouragement and maybe even a little bit of antagonism. No, we're going to be people of reconciliation and forgiveness and love, love, love. And it's going to be the church that says we're looking forward to the weakness becoming strength. We are Riverview Church. 
We are followers of Jesus. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. We will get through this storm by following Him. One more time, we are Riverview Church. We are followers of Jesus. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. We will get through the storm by following Him. Lord God, by Your Spirit, would You seal that into fruition now. And Lord, may You take this church from glory to glory, strength to strength. And for each individual person here, I ask now that you would speak quietly to them and you would show them exactly what they need to do to put your words into practice from this point on. And if you can say amen to that with me, say amen.